yang berusaha, Profesor I.R. Dr. Nur Azwan Abu Osman, Dekan Fakulti Kejuruteraan, Barisan Timbalan Dekan, Barisan Ketua-Ketua Jabatan, Puan Nabila Abdul Mubin, General Manager Upstream Business Analysis and Reporting, Exxon Mobil, Puan Idora Abdul Malik, General Manager Safety, Security, Health and Environment, Exxon Mobil. Ms. Melanie Cook, Senior General Manager Production, Exxon Mobil. Sebenarnya warga University Malaya, para pelajar dan hadirin yang dihormati sekalian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Selamat datang ke program CEO at Faculty Anjuran Fakulti Kejuruteraan bertajuk Gender Diversity and Inclusion Women at the Workplace. Untuk makluman semua, program CEO at Faculty ini merupakan program siri ketiga anjuran Fakulti Kejuruteraan University Malaya selaras dengan inisiatif yang diilhamkan oleh Kementerian Pendidikan Tinggi bagi menjalin kerjasama strategik antara universiti dan industri agar memberi pendedahan kepada pelajar mengenai dunia sebenar pekerjaan melalui Sudut pandangan CEO dan tokoh industri terkemuka dari pelbagai latar belakang membabitkan ahli akademik, para pelajar dan pemain industri. Seterusnya, saya menjemput tontonan puan-puan untuk menyaksikan video korporat Fakulti Kejuruteraan University Melaya dan video Exxon Mobil. University of Malaya is Malaysia's oldest university and one of the oldest in the region. to the environment and society. FUM will teach all the major biomedical factors such as bioinformatics, biomaterial, biomechanics, tissue engineering, neuroengineering, orthotic and prosthetics. Electrical engineering courses at UM are designed to produce creative and innovative electrical engineers. High-tech facilities help us be in tune with rapidly changing technology. Electrical engineering deals with the studies and applications of electricity, electronics, and electromagnetism. Chemical engineers learn how to produce products and provide services in a sustainable manner that are beneficial to both mankind and the planet. Chemical is a very exciting and it's a very old discipline. It opens opportunity to a lot of new and exciting areas like biotechnology, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, nanotechnology, food technology and many other interesting areas. Our courses are accredited by the Engineering Accreditation Council. Our department aims to equip graduates with the ability to apply critical thinking. They can identify, formulate and solve mechanical engineering problems. Our graduates today work in some of the top corporations in Malaysia and at international level. 
my research work was funded under the iPad research throughout my state. And uh, in addition, my funding gives me an opportunity to visit a number of countries. I presented my research work in Japan, I presented part of my work in Croatia and Europe. We promise we will make a world-class engineer out of you. You will be employable, you will be wholesome. To be an internationally renowned faculty of engineering in research, innovation, publication, and teaching. This is our vision. Come and join us. Developing more clean burning natural gas. My job is to turning algae into biofuels. Reducing energy poverty. In the developing world. Making cars go further with less. Fueling the global economy. And you thought we just made the game. Energy lives here. Saya mempersilakan yang berusaha Profesor Dr. Nick Meriam Nick Sulaiman, Profesor Jabatan Kejuruteraan Kimia selaku moderator bagi forum hari ini untuk meneruskan acara. Dipersilakan. Children. Mm -hmm. So the problems that I had faced before would probably be different from what we see now in the age of fourth industrial revolution, social media, and so on. So we have a very uh, good sharing session today, I hope, by a request from Exxon Module and by choice. The CEO program is always an interactive program, no protocols, just call me Nick. Uh, for example, and I think likewise the ladies over here would like to do the same. I have, we have no protocols, I don't even know their CV. So uh, it's going to be done very informally. So for the first round, we're going to invite each one of them to introduce themselves with a key message for about two to three minutes each, and then presto is question and answer. Nothing else. No slides, no equation. They even forget the equation already. <laughs> okay, so shall we go by the very end there, Point Minora, to just introduce yourself for a few short minutes and key message, and we'll just go around in a circle. Go as yours. Assalamu alaikum. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. 
Assalamualaikum and a very good uh, afternoon. My name is uh, Indora uh, Abdul Malik. Um, I am a, a general manager from Exxon Um I went to school like, I don't know, a long, long time ago. <laughs> I am, uh, I've got three kids. Um, they are 22, 20, and as we have it, 19. My girl, uh, my youngest turns 19 today. Oh. And she just uh, finished part home, actually. So, oh. <laughs> hopefully to join you guys uh, soon. Inshallah. Um, um, I um, started my career in Exxon Mobil as a process engineer. I graduated in chemical engineering uh, in the Florida Institute of Technology in the US. And then right after my uh, graduation, I worked in an environmental company in Florida for a couple of years. And then I came back to Malaysia, and Alhamdulillah, got a job with ExxonMobil. In ExxonMobil, in 1993, I uh, started off as a process engineer, and then did a whole slew of, uh, of uh, jobs. Um, like I was a facilities engineer, corrosion and materials engineer, and a planning manager. I was the uh, asset manager for one of the oil fields in uh, Malaysia called Sudibi, if anybody remembers. I was a topics, uh, project manager, Tapis DOR topics, uh, project manager. And until uh, so three years ago, I became the safety, security, health, and environmental uh, manager in ExxonMobil. So I'm very happy to be here. One of the things that I do want to talk about here is um, I think people always have this perception that um, if you do very well at work, you can't have a good life at home. <laughs> so I'm here to uh, share with you my experiences because I think you truly can have a good work-life balance. Okay? Thank you very much. Very inspiring. First line opener from Panidora. Shall we go to Panadila? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. I am very delighted to be here today. Thank you for inviting me in, in this forum. Just looking at you um, students, you are you, fresh already. You <laughs> remind me of my years in university. It really is a few years of my life I would always remember and cherish and uh, you bring back those memories. Um, so it's nice to be here this evening. Just a little bit about myself. I am not as technical as uh, Idora. <laughs> I'm not an engineer. Um, I am an accountant by training. Uh, I graduated with a major in accounting and a minor in computer science. I. After SPM, I continued my study in the United States. I was in New York for one year, then I was in uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. for four years uh, doing accounting and computer science. And as I was graduating, same with Idora a long, long time ago, I got uh, offered uh, uh, by a few companies, and as mobile was one of them, and it was a very easy choice for me to choose as a mobile because I'm from, from Trongganu, and they have operations in Trongganu, so what's come to us, the company will send me back to my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> so I joined as a mobile, um, and so it's been 26 years. During the 26, 26 years, I've, other than you know going to places and doing different things in the company, I managed to get married, and uh, get, had um, four children. I lost one of them five years ago, but uh, I have three now. My eldest one is 22 years old, um, second 18 years old, and the third one is 16 years old. Um, what do I do in ExxonMobil? When I joined, I was its um, accountant, and I had an assignment in Kuala Lumpur, and then I uh, went to work in Kurte at that time as on mobile had an office in Kurte and then um, back to Kuala Lumpur and then I had uh, an opportunity to go for an assignment in Doha in Qatar for a short, for a short assignment and then I was sent to Houston 
Texas in US. Um, I was there for five years. I did a couple of uh, jobs, there three jobs there, and then I was transferred to Dubai. Over there, I was overseeing the financial reporting for our operations in Iraq. I was there for three years, and uh, three years ago, I came back to Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And now the business analysis and reporting management. Your interest, of course, is uh, you know diversity in the workplace. What do we mean by diversity in the workplace? Um, companies in general, if you look at uh, a long, long time ago, maybe before you were born, pretty much everywhere globally, uh, men dominate working environments, right? Uh, for all the companies in the world, all the top, the top uh, leaders are all. You know, female, uh, male, sorry. So um, companies are more and getting more and more diverse now. I would like to talk a little bit about you know diversity. Why is it good? Why is it not good? Um, why diversity is not only good in the outlook for a company, but it also it is also good in the bottom line in the financials, right? That's all. <laughs> That's good for a beginning. And now we're going to move on to this panel of talks from down under. We will like to speak in three minutes. Salma Tengahari or Salma Patan. Namasayo Melanie. Sayo Tingal di Malaysia. Sudah tiga tahun. Saya berbesar hati karena dapat berada di sini petang ini. Izin saya berbicara. Uh, I'm still a student of Bahasa Malaysia, as you can hear, um, but it is a great honour to be here, but also to be in a wonderful country. Uh, and that is an opportunity that ExxonMobil has given myself and my family, so I am very grateful for that. Uh, me in, three, in, a, in a few words. I uh, started in Australia as, a, as an engineer straight out of university. I studied chemical engineering and mathematics uh, at the University of Melbourne. And I, I joined ExxonMobil because they offered childcare. I did not have children. I was not thinking about getting married. Although I knew my husband, I did not know he would be my husband. Uh, we, he studied university, he studied engineering as well with me. Uh, and I've never looked back. I've had assignments in Australia, in the US, and here in Malaysia. And I am now the senior, senior general manager here. So I have responsibility for our offshore operation um, in the South China Sea as well as our technical organisation, all of our engineers here in Malaysia. So what the one message I wanted to share with you is about support. Um, you, you have heard the saying, behind every great man is a great woman. Yes. yes. Well, behind every professional woman is a great man. <laughs> I shared that my, my husband is also an engineer. Uh, we have shared uh, our careers. He does not work for ExxonMobil, uh, but we have taken turns as to who uh, has the career opportunity and who takes more responsibility at home. So when our children were very small, I, I took uh, time out of work. I took one year off after each of my children. I worked part-time, and my husband's career was our, was our lead career. And now with the opportunity to come here, and, here to Malaysia, 
Uh, my husband has stopped working for now and is full time at home with our children. And, and that's why I say I talk about him being a great man because it is all about partnership. Marriage is about partnership. But being successful in our careers is also about sharing the parenting and sharing and sharing the professional responsibilities. So for now, I take the lead on the professional and he takes the lead in our house. And um, I am always, always grateful for him. Every night I come home and, and give him my greatest praise for um, him making the sacrifices that he is making, but also for him embracing the raising of our children the way he is. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. There you are from the three ladies. We have had no single equation being told yet. It's about relationship. So for the first round, we have uh, Juan Vidara talking about work life balance. Um, Juan Navila talking about diversity and the need for it in the, new, uh, in the way that you do your work. And of course, from Melody, there's a great man behind every woman. So there you are, we're talking beyond, beyond engineering. And I think because we want to keep it as santai as possible, have you heard the word santai <laughs> as possible? Can we open to the floor first to know the kind of questions that you are interested in? Then we can get back to the uh, members of the forum today to see uh, what they feel about it. Can I have well, the first three questions from anybody? Just please identify yourself. Do they have me from the top? Can you? Yes. Gentlemen, one. Gentlemen, two. Can I have one more? Just to get a feel of the uh, questions around. Three questions first. Never mind, we can start with uh, the guy over there. Well, uh, you can shop, try to shop. Uh, yes. uh, my name is Amir Fidaos. I'm from I'm first year from Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Wali Dora uh, about the, looking back on your education, right? Uh, what do you think was the deciding moment that had you to decide what you wanted to do when you grew up? What, Great. what do you think? Great question. Uh, while Polidora is thinking about that, we have the second question. It's <laughs> all me. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Han Jozing. I'm a PhD student studying gender diversity. I want to ask uh, how you, what is your business policy uh, uh, of uh, ExxonMobil that uh, Facing uh, how you handle the gender diversity in your workplace, and uh, example, how how do you handle transgender uh, workers as well, and how do you create a safety environment for them? Uh, and so Relevant to the topic, I guess. Can I have a third question, preferably from uh, Miss? Yes. Hello, so my name is Carrie Ann and I'm in my final year being a uh, chemical engineering. So being a working woman and mother is not that easy. So how do you remain successful while having a husband and a child? Just <laughs> thinking forward. <laughs> Thank you very much for all the questions. I think we can have some short answers. So fun later. Thank you. Uh, Oh, sorry. Amir. Amir. Thank you, Amir, for the question. I was passing students. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I think, honestly, there is no decided moment. You sort of go into it, like for me, my experience. I went into engineering because I, I really like to know how things work. And I love doing um, uh, I, I really enjoyed understanding how things happen. So that's why I decided to go into engineering. 
And then there comes a time when, uh, okay, do you want to muscle, do you want to go into civil engineering? Uh, no, soil. Mm. <laughs> uh, mechanical, uh, maybe not. But I really like chemistry. I didn't know actually when I started chemical engineering that chemistry was only for the first two years, right? And then you start doing uh, all your quantum physics and all of that, but it was very interesting. So a short answer to your question is, I didn't, it didn't dawn on me until I was in my third year in university that I really liked doing what I was studying. And I don't think, I know how people say, you, um, when you like what you're doing, it's really not a job. That's absolutely true. So you need to cultivate a love for what you're doing because there's always something interesting. You need to have an inquisitive mind and you need to always try to pursue the things that you love. Okay? Answer the question. Maybe just from the perspective, we like to say something. So if you want to I think um, my choice to go, I don't know if that's working or not, but my, my, no, it's working. Okay, thanks. Um, my choice to go into engineering was, was really about the fact that I went to an older school and that I felt as though I was being, at the school I went to, that there was a strong push for me to go into a certain type of career. And I've always been a little bit of a free thinker and and that I'm sort of a little bit, no, you know, just because you think that that's the right type of career for me, I'm sort of gonna make a little bit of a stand about this. So I was a little bit rebellious initially. Um, the other part of it was that my, my father is a, a plumber. So we came from very, very modest background. I was the first in my family to, to study engineering, or study at university. No, none of my other relatives had ever been to university. And so uh, it was something that my dad approved of. You know, that there was an, out, there was an aspect of, he could, he could relate to what an engineer did. So between my own sort of um, desire to be a little bit different, but then also my, my dad thinking, yeah, that's a, that's a noble career for you to go into. I think it was really both of those things that, that originally drew me to engineering. But it very quickly became a lot, like as Isadora described. Thank you, Melanie. Even though you don't ask me, I'm going to answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so this all what I true. <laughs> Uh, it was not love at first sight with engineering as well. For me, it was a process of elimination. After <laughs> no magical, no basic yeah. science. Okay, let's try engineering. And of course, the love grows after that. And I have no regrets to engineering at all. I think we can go to the next question. Yes, the question is, was it about uh, a soft mobile policy with regards to diversity and inclusiveness? Um, uh, a soft mobile has always been a uh, uh, company with a strong uh, advocation on diversity and inclusiveness. Now, when we talk about diversity here, we not only talk about gender diversity, we, we, we talk about male, female, and um, other genders, but we also talk about other diversities when it comes to religion, when it comes to color, skin colors, right? Uh, which is not very apparent here in Malaysia, but in other countries we operate in. Uh, when it comes to um, um, other beliefs, um, we we have been very strong in that area. Now, still, during the 26 years that I've been in my company, my personal observation is that even the companies as strong as ExxonMobil move with the, uh, the, 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 the people that we operate in, right? In the past, a lot of, when I first joined the company, a lot of uh, talk about inclusiveness and diversity was about 
letting the females to be part of the decision-making leadership team in the company. Now, as a mobile, since it's a, it's a very international company, it has always had a, a big uh, percentage of uh, women in the company. But the number of those women in the company going up the ladder and eventually become the uh, decision-making team of the company were very few many, many years ago. And we see that you know, moving along and the percentage gets higher and higher now. However, lately, I would say the last 10 years, the, the discussion on uh, inclusiveness and diversifying, all of those include other things. It includes people who are, it includes gender, that you talk about more than just male and female. It also includes um, discussions around um, races, skin colors, ethnics, um, religion, and um, the has been the company has always been very clear that we have to be open to all of those as long as your belief, your uh, uh, practice does not interrupt you delivering what you're supposed to deliver to the company as an employee, the company should not should support you uh, in those aspects. I think the last question was really talking about work-life balance and thoughts, which has been touched upon by each one of you in some introductory uh, remarks. So I, I wonder if you would like to whether it details to help carry and is it? Yes. Uh, on the uh, question that she asked, because she's really looking for final year student, to my student, yes. in engineering, and one to know how do we how do we go forward? Carry on, the challenge. Um. Okay. It's a partnership, like many people say. It's a partnership. Um. I think. When you talk about work-life balance, a lot of people think it's a it's a seesaw, right? So if you take from one, the other the other the other side suffers, right? It feels like it's a competition. It's either work or home. Betul? <laughs> it's not. It should complement one another. So really, I mean, if you if you ask the guys around here. Would they appreciate getting extra money at home? <laughs> would they? I'm sure they would. <laughs> so, all I'm saying is, it is a, um, it's, it can be a long discussion by the way, but I'll keep it very short. It is a partnership between you and your husband, and making, there are times when you need to give in a little bit, there are times when the person has to give in a little bit. But the whole, com the whole family will prosper um, based on the decisions that you've made. There are things that you can do uh, in the office as well. You can talk to your, to, your, to your supervisors. You can make sure that they know the, um, at what point in life you're at, that you need maybe a little bit more uh, flexibility. But it can be worked. Can you imagine you work, your, you work yourself out for four years Try study really hard, get fantastic grades, can give back to the society, and suddenly what do you do? You stay at home. You will end it at the end. <laughs> I think Melanie has talked quite a bit on the support which she's been getting from this partnership, mm. domestic partnership. Mm. So finally, I think you have some thoughts on that. Sure. Um, you know, I've read quite a bit, you know, being as old as I am, read quite a bit about women working. What is the formula out there, you know? Sometimes you read an article which tells you that, hey, you, you, if, if you're working, you have to be careful, you have to make sure you allocate uh, enough time for your children at home. If not, they grow up to be people who don't know you. Um, and then you read another article about, you know, female must, you know, must be successful, get to the leadership uh, team. 
And then uh, another article saying that, hey, women, you know, no matter how successful you are, you are still a wife to a man. And um, you have to take care of your husband, or if not, your husband is going to find somebody else. <laughs> All these things, right? Can you get confused sometimes? Is there a formula out there that is the right formula? Now, for me, I think there is no right formula. There is no one formula that is right for everybody. Because all of us are different and we are put in a, in, in a position with different type of people around us. All three of us are here and we are quite successful in the same company, but if you ask all of us, we are very different in terms of the husbands we got married to, the children that we, we raised. So really, the answer is going to be what you are, who you are, and uh, how who you end up getting married to, and the children. You know, sometimes you plan to, you plan up ahead. I've seen people who plan things up ahead, you know. I want to get married to somebody who for sure will support me, right? Um, and then I'm going to have children and I'm going to continue working. Then, then she has children and one of the child is a special child. Requires additional attention, right? So because of that, you have to, um, in a way, sacrifice a little bit of your working uh, hours and spend a little bit more time with the children, unlike your friend who is next door to you in the office. So it's different, the ladder to success and the formula is different from one person to another. But what I think is important is that it's not how much time you spend with your children or at work or with your husband, it is the quality of that time. And I'm sure, you know, all three of us will be agree on that point, is the quality of that time. Um, I just, just bring it back to home. <laughs> People ask me, Nabila, how do you manage? When I was in Houston, I, I didn't have my husband with me. I had three grown up, growing up children in Houston. And it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough. And um, what did I have to do? Over there, the schools over there are not like here. There are a lot of uh, parents' involvement in the school. You don't just send your children to school and you go to work and you get a report card at the end of the semester. You don't. You go and there are meetings with the teachers and there is there's a, a report card meetings and there is a sports day which I need to go and and arrange the children and then I have to go and paint on the walls of the school sometimes raise money for the for the school all sorts of things. Um, but it's the quality that of time that you need to decide on. So you don't just sit around. So for people who work, and all of you, when you end up working, when you go back home, you have to look for your children. Make sure you have dinner with your children. Make sure you say good night to your children, no matter how late you go home. Make sure your babies don't sleep with your maid, but with you, right? Those kind of little, little quality things that makes a difference. Do you know that I'm evaluating your question, your answers? <laughs> I don't know that. When you look at them, you wouldn't believe that they have all these challenges, and but they have risen up. Give them a clap. And so many of you are on the same page with all these uh, ladies as well, and they, they have indeed done very well. So I, I'm going to open uh, another set of. Questions from the floor? Any takers now? One? Any more? Okay, you can start. Uh, we give chance to other people first. Yes? Uh, okay, assalamualaikum and good afternoon. My name is Nefatina Jordi. I'm a first year student from the Biomedical Engineering Department. Uh, I'm going to ask you questions. To so all the panels and uh, fellow moderator as well. Uh, first of all, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, <laughs> um, I hope it's not too early to have this kind of question, but have you ever encountered any kind of gender discrimination in your workplace? Uh, 
uh, and then secondly, since this is um, an informal kind of discussion, I couldn't help but notice that um, uh, how, how do I phrase this? Um, how, how do you take care of your skin? <laughs> treatment because you get it you get the best room with a bathroom and we all have to share and you know and, and those types of things but um, but actually my experience was a little bit more around that that people probably gave me a little bit gave me a, a second chance more I actually found that that really that I was that there was a little bit of a okay it's this is a different situation there were a lot of a lot of men that I worked with who were maybe my father's age and they were looking at me more like their daughter than their colleague. And so the discrimination was well intended. It wasn't, it wasn't like they were trying to do the wrong thing by me. It was almost like they were trying to ex give me extra help or give me more chances because it was, it was unusual for them to have a woman in their workplace and they weren't quite sure how to, how to handle that situation. Um, I, I have worked in different cultures though where my style is different to the place where I work and, and I think that that has probably at times been more of a challenge than, it, than it's been more about the fact that I'm female. It might be more that, um, you know, my, the way that people talk to each other in Australia is different to the way they talk to each other in America and much more than I expected actually. And so, you know, Australians can be quite sarcastic and make, you know, <laughs> silly little jokes to each other and, and these Americans would get really upset, <laughs> like really offended. I'm like, it's a joke, it's a joke, you know. So, so I actually found sometimes sort of integrating into a different culture made it, made it a little bit more challenging than the fact that I was female. That's another form of diversity though. And, and, you know, and I worked in a team in the US that were from, there were maybe 10 of us from, or maybe 15 of us from 10 different countries. Um, and, and so us trying to gel and work together was actually quite a difficult thing. And it wasn't until we got to understand about each other's families and where we come from that people really started to work out how to work well together. At the beginning it was sort of all a little bit 
bit more friction than necessary. A long answer, but I, I, I'm really struggling a little bit to think about specifically being discriminated against because I was female. On the skin comment, can I just make one thing? This is happiness. <laughs> Okay, back. Okay. Okay. Um, discriminated against because I'm a woman. I'm a woman. Um, no. Totally agree with Melanie. I think people go uh, bend over backwards to help because I'm a woman, especially when I was uh, a young engineer offshore. So um, the other thing that also helped is, that, is because Exxon Mobil has a very strict harassment policy. So if, for example, you feel harassed, you will be harassed. It, it doesn't matter whether the guy who's speaking to you thinks that he's not harassing you. But if you feel harassed, you have, you have the right to go and complain. Okay? So we take that very, very seriously. So that's why the question on inclusion and diversity, that's why we, we are uh, very inclusive and we want to be diverse because we know that everybody brings a different skill and a different expertise and you need everybody. You don't want everybody to be just like us. You don't get that uh, knowledge to grow. So that's, that's, that's uh, question number one. Number two, I think you asked about, um, I'm ignoring the skin comment. <laughs> Sorry. Because I think my skin's not that good anymore. <laughs> um, the thing about does this, do I, do I think that the university uh, should, uh, what was the question? Sorry? Play a big role in Play a big role in finding jobs. jobs. I'm sure uh, in all universities, especially UN, you would have counselors to help. Um, lead you to the right uh, uh, companies, the right positions. So I don't think um, it's a problem. Uh, that's, that's me as an outsider looking in. But I think what's more important in a university is to teach the students here to open their minds and be uh, good human beings, um, inquisitive human beings. Um, and and, and um, that's the role, that's the thing that you should, um, that you should ask uh, all the students to demand of your professors. I'm sure your professors do that anyway, but all I'm saying is learn more, see more, think more. Okay? Yeah, I just um, to add a little bit to what uh, Ikeno finished off with on the uh, recruitment, what uh, university, the role that university should play. Yes, I, I agree with Aurora. I'm sure the universities have played some sort of role already to to get placements for um, for the students. However, the key thing in uh, recruitment is you yourself. The university can only open up a door for you, or maybe suggest and propose for you to approach companies or for the companies to approach the university. But the moment it stops right there, the moment you go for an interview, the university doesn't play any role anymore. It's all about you, how you present yourself, whether we see you as somebody, a whole person, who is not only capable academically because you know if you get called for an interview, an interview of course your your um, results must be good already. But in person, in addition to the curriculum, it's you you your personality. Do you have the strength? Do you have the communication capability to be able to work well with people? Uh, from different, from all sorts of countries with different languages and interact in English fluently, uh, eloquent and able to um, analyze situations, maturity, all of those, uh, all, all about yourself, yeah? And um, what, what was the another one? It's on, um, you, you still want the skin. <laughs> Oh, the skin, I agree with Melanie, is all about beauty from inside. <laughs> well, actually, 
eventually, eventually, you will feel like, oh, come on, come on, Amila. You know, get it from inside. I truly believe that. Um, I don't believe you will never look pretty and your skin will never be glowy if you walk around sulking <laughs> all day. You smile all the time. We have problems all the time. Everybody has problems. At home, I wake up, I have problems at home. Driving on the road, I have problems. In office, I have problems, but we always smile, and I think that will help a lot. Very positive vibes from all of them, isn't it? Uh -huh. And I think they can be university professors anytime. We can invite them to become honorary <laughs> university professors. Especially in saying that we should not just think about you know the the academic part. It's, it's beyond academic that you should try to stretch yourself, which students sometimes don't see in the university. Yes, communication is. I can say how important it is. It's very very important. And uh, I, let me share a little bit uh, more about that. I I feel disappointed sometimes when we are trying to get uh, to hire people, right? And we look at. Uh, uh, your, your your papers and we look at your photos and we scan and we cut to a certain number of people to come and interview. When, when we do that, we already have in mind who we want to target based on the results, right? And uh, But when the person comes in, the first three sentences you say already tells us sometimes, very often, already tells us we cannot hire this person, which is very disappointing for me sometimes when I really want to hire this person because I know he's smart, I know she's smart, but she's not going to be able to make it in the company because you like it or not, in the international, multinational company like Amazon Mobile, you've got to have a very good uh, command of English because very often you'll be working with people who are not even in your country. You are on teleconference all the time, and you have to convince people that them you were looking at your face, they don't even know how you look like, right? So, in even more important in the current uh, modern environment, whereby everything is on the net, on the net, that you have very, very good communication. What would you say be the giveaway things uh, with the three sentences that you can tell? The students may want to know that. Yes. They can hide it or something like that. You mean in, in the interview? During the interview, yes. Yes, if, if, if you, you you start talking and you're, we are okay with imperfect grammar, but if, if really, you know, if you don't make sense. We are, I, is, you know, it is just, you know, right yet. away. <laughs> yes. Yes, you just, you have, you like it or not, you don't like, I, when I was a student, I didn't like, I didn't like language, so I didn't like English, but I was thrown in the US, I had no choice, I was the only Malaysian student in the whole university at that time, so I think it's American, so I had a big doubt, I have no choice, even more so for you guys, you really, you have no choice, you have to learn speaking uh, well, yeah. Good point there. Um, we have in the audience not only students, we also have staff members. So, <laughs> you're really shaking the head. <laughs> any, uh, any questions from the, the rest? Okay, we'll take one over there. And come. Assalamualaikum. Uh, I'm Farhana. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I currently work part time as uh, as well as a student. So I put like I assume like let's say um, the challenge that I had faced during part time working. Let's say I, if I cannot face, um, maybe I cannot survive in another places. So what kind of uh, how can you cope with uh, diverse aspect of challenges during working? Thank you. Uh, uh, I am uh, Mohamed Amar uh, I am biomedical engineering, uh, first year. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, as we know, all of us, that the women 
generally female are more patient and more emotional, more than, <laughs> than men. So does this affect, for example, as I know, I think uh, you are taking very important places in your companies. So does this affect your decision sometimes you have to make very strict decision uh, for some, some, some person or something? Does this patient emotion pick it to take that decision? Uh, another question is, how do you manage, as we know that you have special cases of pregnancy, sometimes you are pregnant, so how do you manage that thing? Sometimes you have to, you should be absent from the company because you are pregnant. So how do you, do they have uh, two beers in one place as a woman or something like that? Thank you. Shall we go with your questions? Do you start with the second question? Yeah, you can start with the second question first. All right, so um, on the question of emotion, I would say to you that men are as emotional as women. <laughs> we just show it in different ways. And women show it in different ways from each other. Um, you know, we're all human beings with feelings and with very, you know, a, a real sense of what's right and wrong. You know, and, and I and I and I truly believe that um, in a in a in a diverse environment where everybody can express their opinion in a way that they feel respected, that it takes all the emotion out of it. But you have to you have to believe that you are honestly that you that you are it's um, safe for you to be able to express your opinion and that your opinion is going to be respected. So to me, that the, the outcome to me is that if, if, you are in, if we work in an environment like that, then there are no, there are no emotional decisions. And, there are, and it is not a, a question of you know, um, male versus female. Anybody who does not feel, and I've seen this, I've seen this on occasion, where somebody who feels that their opinion is not being listened to or respected, that they're the ones that will get emotional about it, they may show it in a different way, they may show it through anger, they may show it through just shutting down and not and not participating anymore. Um, but they are all they are all emotional responses. Um, so on the question of of, of pregnancy and um, you know, I, I would say that everybody has days where they don't feel well. Everybody. And sometimes it might be because I've got a a cold and or sometimes it might be because I don't feel well because I am carrying a child but um, when we when in our workplace we allow people we say to people we only want you here if you are fit and healthy and in the right frame of mind to be able to work and that's why we have um, medical leave allowances and and flexible work hours and other considerations that we give to people, whether it be because they personally don't feel well, whether they've got a family member who is not well, whether it be their parent, or their child, or their husband, or their wife, that we allow people to be, we recognise that people have things that they need to cope with outside of, outside of work. And, and so, again, if we're in a, us creating an environment where people know that we have we have policies that allow people to take the time they need for their own um, personal well-being. Um, also creates an environment of trust and respect. And so I think both of those things allow people to, when they are at work, to be focused and to and to make decisions that are logical rather than driven by emotion. All of those in all of those situations can result in somebody making an emotional decision if they're not don't ca take care of this, themselves and their family first. Truly answers from experience that you can't get in textbook. Yeah. Right? Yes. And they're really solid answers that I think uh, everybody can agree when they think about it. One, Fedora, you want to add something on emotions? I think. Uh, I've seen cases, and this is really from experience, okay? I've seen cases where uh, women, perhaps because, you know, they, they know that they've got, um, maybe they, they show their emotions more, they've taught themselves 
So we just uh, step back, take stock of everything, walk away, and then come back. And when they came back, they gave fantastic decisions that no one would ever have read of. Okay? So it's really knowing about yourself, knowing about... You know, there's a point where you say, okay, let's, let's, let's move back. Let's talk. Take stock of what's happening. And then come back. There's always a way to, to, um, to overcome whatever um, <coughs> weaknesses or perceived weaknesses that you may have. There's always a way. You just need to have the will to do that. Okay? So for you all you ladies out there and all you men who, who will have wives one day, be very supportive of your wife because uh, going back to uh, the Quran, right? Okay. The wife is made out of your of Adam's ribs, right? Yes. So, so you've got to be supportive of it because your wife and the husband makes a unit. Goes back to the goes back to what we talked about. You've got to be together to make sure that you have a good family life, which involves a good career as well. Okay. I think they both say they are yeah. 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 They have the same page on many things and uh, as I observe and I also believe this comes from experience that really it, it, it works out and in the end the to space life changes and so on. Okay, are we on the uh, final round or not? Mm. How are you for time? You're fine? Yes. More questions? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can use a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good evening. Um, my name is Lilani Yaneska. I'm not from this faculty. I am from University Malaya, University Malaya's Cultural Center, uh, taking up uh, a Bachelor in Performing Arts majoring in Drama. So uh, my question is, as women, and women in modern day, what is your source of strength and motivation when it comes to juggling before balancing everything from career to family to friends, everything, and to yourself? What is your inner and your own source of motivation and strength? That's all. Both, both of them are looking at me. Because <laughs> you're out, and you're out, motivation and strength. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My motivation and strength is better. My son better is smoking. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, of course it is also. Now, um, your. For me personally, and this is going to be very personal, right? One, it, it can differ from one person to another. And uh, even within one person, it can change from one time, one um, era of your life going to the next, depending on where you are in your place of life, right? When I was a student, when I was young, uh, really all I wanted to do is to get best grades that I can get for my parents to be proud of me, and then I get a good job so that I can make money in the future. Let's face it, we, you know, that's that, that was the motivation. But as I progressed further to have a family, now the motivations became different, right? And as also when, as, as I grow older, there is more spiritual motivation coming into the picture. So the the focus in life, I would say, if I from the beginning of working um, to just you know getting the best promotion, getting out there, doing the best in the company, all those. When I started to have family, is to have a, a, a good uh, family, raise my children in a in a full some way as a, to, so that they grow up to be good 
a society and a good uh, a person, a good Muslim, and um, and then get good education, get a good job in the future. That's one part of my motivation. The other part of the motivation is, of course, my own satisfaction. You can't, you can't let that go, right? Although sometimes people say that it's very important for you to take care of your children, very important for you to take care of uh, the husband. You cannot take care of anybody until you take care of yourself. That is your, you spiritually, mentally, as well as physically. So for me, I always see put me, myself, as my utmost motivation. I have to be happy. And the reason I'm being with uh, Azon Mobile from day one until now, I never have any thought of changing companies because I'm happy in the company. And, uh, and the company is not meant for everybody. Some people who join the company do not fit very well. Mm -hmm. And they have to go and they're much happier in other company and that's fine. So you have to find happiness and for me, that, that's what drives me to go to work, feel good to go to work every day. And then at this age, you know, I'm about going to be 50 next year. So, you know, spiritual comes into the picture. I want to be able, I want to be able to balance between taking care of my career, taking care of my children and family, as well as my afterlife. So I want to have that time for me to go to classes, you know, the, the religious class, go to the mosque sometimes, those things. So it change, your motivation change as you as you grow and you have to please that yourself. But one thing is to remember, don't forget yourself. You have to put yourself at a very important uh, place in your agenda. Okay. I have nothing to add, but you, you stole the word that I'm <laughs> Yeah, I mean, ha happiness and, and making sure that you feel that the things you're doing are for you and for you, you know, the greater good of your family is all the, all the happiness I need. If I can add, one motivation for me is one, to make sure that everybody is safe. Because the work that I do, I'm a safety manager. Yes. <laughs> yes. But the other thing for me is I want to make sure that with the experience that I learn, you guys benefit from it. So the young ones benefit from it. Use me and my colleagues as a springboard to go even higher. Don't start right from the bottom. Start where we leave off. So that's why I urge you guys. You guys need to be hungry. You guys need to learn more. You guys need to open your minds. Just don't think about small, um, small issues that you may think very is it very important to you. But in the whole scheme of things, does it mean anything? You might not understand this now, by the way, <laughs> because when I was young as well, I I didn't understand a lot of the things what my mother said. But listen to what. You know, somebody older, like your professors are saying, because they've gone through all of this and they know what's good, what's good for all of us. Thank you. Great motivators, and really, I couldn't agree more with what they said. Maybe just to touch upon the self aspect, because I'm also doing the sustainability thing, and what I've learned so far from being sustainable is to be self-sustaining first before you try to ask people to do sustainable things. So it jives very well with all the answers that we have got so far. Yes. I think the part-time person has also left. <laughs> Yeah. But you can still answer, yes, oh, for some the reason. The, uh, she was trying to balance a part-time job as well oh, as being a student as well. I think she was there at the yeah. time, but maybe she has to go out for some reason. But the rest also can benefit from yeah. the question, if I understand correctly, it's about balancing jobs, isn't it? Especially, uh, when you are a student, she, she does part-time and she also studying. Is that what you agree her question was? 
Or was there another angle to the question? Yeah, because she, she's doing part-time job and she's also following it full-time closely. Whether that's advisable, because some uh, you know, nowadays you may need to do extra jobs to cover for many things. Uh, living in a city area, you may not be able to make things uh, cope. And also uh, some courses, not engineering definitely, you are occupied nearly 24-7, but there are some courses that allow you time there to do other things. Yeah. So your, your take. Yeah. I suppose my comment on that is it's, it's always, you'll go through phases of your life where there is more that you need to do or think you need to do than you have time to do it. And, and so there's, it's, it's about how do you adapt your, your response to that situation over time. So if you're studying full time and you're spending you know, days and nights working um, as well and you uh, feel like you can't, you've not getting enough sleep or you feel as though you're not having any downtime at all, then it will feel like a chore. It definitely will feel like a chore. And, um, and so it's, it's about how to find some time out from all of that. And it may, again, it's about quality rather than quantity. Um, my husband and I, when we were both working full time in Australia and we had two small children, no home help, no, um, you know, everything, cleaning the house, cooking, washing, taking the kids to school, one of them sick, who stays home? You know, it was, it was like a pressure cooker. There was no, there was really no room for error or, you know, no degrees of freedom. Um, and, and it was, it did feel like a pressure cooker. But he and I made this pact that on a Saturday morning, once a month, it would be John's Saturday morning. And John, on a Saturday, did not have any obligations to the family. John, between you know 9 a.m. and midday, he could do what he want. He could go and play golf, he could sleep all morning, he could lie in front of the TV, no obligations. And then the next Saturday would be Melanie Saturday. The same thing. So Melanie can go to the movies with her friends, or she can, you know, go and have coffee with her mum or Whatever. It was just three hours. It was three hours every few weeks. But I will tell you that made such a huge difference to a, to a, for our relationship because it felt like in the midst of everything being pressure cooker and so busy, 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 and it was that we were losing. We were losing something. You know, we were losing ourselves in that. And so it was really, I mean, it was, to me, it was just such a little experiment we did, and it really, really worked well for us. So I encourage you that when you go through times in your life like that, where you feel like there's more to do than you can, you must just take that time out. You must find a way to take that time out, whichever, however you do that. Maybe I just add a little bit to that. I completely agree with what Melanie said you have to say something to, to, to zero out yourself and recharge, right? Another thing I find out you know, that is very important to be able to juggle things in a busy schedule, and you have busy schedule all the time of your life, so trust me. Yeah. If you want to be, you're going to UN now, you want to be successful, you will always be busy. Now with part-time work, in the future, in a few time going to work, with family, you will always be busy. One skill that I think is very useful for me to juggle things is the ability to shut off, turn on and turn off my mind. Mm -hmm. I don't mix up my feelings and emotions from work to hope. Mm -hmm. Now, it's mm -hmm. so almost impossible to do that, right? But you can limit that. Mm -hmm. You can limit that. The moment I leave my office, get into my car and drive in the car. I would listen either to the music or the, the, the preaching in the car. My mind shut office, you know, shuts off from office. I move to my sing with the songs, whatever not. I get home, I'm with my family. 
the five million dollar issue I have in office. Mm -hmm. Sukiman's uh, uh, place is ne near me, and he always complains. Oh, you always talk about millions and millions and millions. <laughs> um, it, I really turn it off. I, I really turn it off, and. Uh, when I go to office, I do have problems at home, and uh, children call me, and uh, but I, I I turn off. I answer call, and the moment I hang up, I focus on the, on the work. This ability, I think, is a skill, and you have to learn to do that. And it's very very important to learn from now how to shut on, shut, you know, turn off, uh, shut off and turn on when you do things, and that will let you do things with full passion, right? When you study, you study with full passion. You don't start studying and thinking about, oh, my parents at home were having a fight last night, and I'm not happy about that. Da 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 da. da. You focus on your study when you go home, you know. So those those are very important. What do you think, ladies? I think you guys will be all that. Yeah. If I can add, the um, the other thing, two two things. One is if you can get support system, get support system. There are people who you can reach out to, even the NGOs, for example, who can who can help you out. The second one is really. Don't sweat the small stuff, yeah. right? So identify the things that are important for you or to you, and then this little little stuff, let it slide. It's not worth your time. It's not worth your brain power. But you need to identify what these are. Okay? Truly great answers. I mean, they they are living examples of things that make what they are. I, I, amidst all the challenges about sweating the small stuff and so on, but being students at this age, they will have to learn. It is something that you have to pay with experience, yeah. not with, you know, they have to pay with time. And time. But um, don't worry, you will get there with the right set of uh, information. And as like Igora says, you should jump from the platform that we are in, not slide back and you know, learn things again. You should jump off from the next level. Okay, I think we're on the final round because it's already about four something. Any burning questions? Ah, okay. Okay, short, short ones. <laughs> Don't burn it up yet. Yes. Can you start? I'm from My question is nowadays, well, what do you think? The woman can go to the job easily, banned by man, or the man still, ha still get the high chance? Okay, we get to the next question while they're thinking about it. There's somebody at the back over there. Hi, uh, I'm Anisha, um, biomedical engineering first year student. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, um, you must have uh, encountered a tough or difficult moment during your study or at work. What did you do at that time? And, and another question is that, regarding the interview, what kind of um, criteria that the interview will look uh, in a candidate? Like, what do you want to see from a candidate during your interview? Do you think that's all? Yeah. Maybe not everybody needs to answer this. Yeah. You can take one each, and I think that's uh, another question from there. Yes. Hi, I'm, um, it's me again. I have a question for Ms. Melanie. Uh, so, what are the, some of the challenges for women working offshore? And why is there such a small percentage of women in oil and engineering? That's all for me. Okay. Um, you, you, you remember your yeah, question? We're trying to, we're yeah, trying we're trying to divide out. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. There was a uh, question from here. Yes, so I'm going to go My question is Does the road or the chance of women to get a job change depending on their culture or conditions? Do it in the country? Is it a global country or wealthy country? Or the country suffering from poverty? 
So that, that's my boss you for interviews. And then there is a question on um, the ability to get a job based on gender in different different part of the world. Is that mm -hmm. that question? Yeah, maybe so maybe I answer that because I've been in three continents, I think, working in uh, Malaysia and US. I was hiring in US and hiring also in Dubai. I was in Qatar, but I didn't do any hiring there. Um, the, the answer is, unfortunately, there is a difference in terms of intake and the possibility of getting a job, uh, depending on your gender, where, where you are. Uh, like it or not, in Middle East, I find out that um, the, the acceptance of uh, women into the workforce is not as um, it's not the same as in other countries, in the Western countries, not even at the same level as uh, Southeast Asia in Malaysia, right? They, not only the intake there is uh, more towards uh, men, at the same time, even when you're already in the company, the, the potential for you to go up the ladder is uh, less for women. And this, I'm talking about the local, okay? We are talking about the, com the local companies, not as a mobile working in Iraq, working in Dubai. Because when I was in Doha, for instance, I was in the local company in Qatar Gas at that time. Very obvious that uh, all the managerial and leadership positions were all men. And even when I was there presenting my thought, my proposals, they, they respect, they listen to me out of respect, but I can tell that they were not going to accept what I say as easily as had I been a man. Um, it's, it's quite obvious, and I did, of course this was about 15 years ago. I don't know if, I'm sure things have changed somewhat, but it would not be all the way balanced today. So there is that difference. However, let's talk about Malaysia. In Malaysia, I don't feel that there is that difference if you are talking about going to a corporation of public listed companies. If, of course, the case might be different if you go to family-oriented or family-operated company or uh, uh, Sendri and Berhad, you might get the, the owner's opinion of diversity, genders, will impact the hiring. But when it comes to the corporation type of companies, um, I'm, I feel that uh, it's quite balanced. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any, any, any question that we missed just yeah. now? Sorry. Yeah. That was the question that we missed? I was asking, uh, what are the challenges for women working offshore? Offshore, yes, specifically. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of what are the challenges actually. Like, like, I, like we, we told you, uh, we were given, at least I feel, we were given preferential treatment when we're offshore because the guys had to share bathrooms and we had our own bathrooms, right? Um, so, so really, uh, I don't see any. Uh, I think people want be just because you're a, you're a female, I mean, like, uh, when I was offshore, just like Melody, we had like a hundred men, and that was little old me, a little young me, sorry, little young me there. So everybody wanted to help, right? Everybody wanted to say, uh, Yora, you know? So I was able to use the opportunity to learn more about the things that they're doing because they were more than happy to show me. So if you're worried about if they're going to be, um, 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 you know, uh, hardship for you to go offshore, um, there may be some, but in my experience, it would be very far and few in between. In fact, they would love you there. <laughs> okay, every good thing must come to an end. It's been a very uh, successful time. You just look at these ladies from the bottom of my heart. I really find them really good examples of iconic examples of what Malaysians can do and also Australians can do. They are living examples. You can see from their beauty, their skin, 
And it's not just coming from the head, it's really coming from the heart and the experience and it shows it. I couldn't agree more with all the answers that they have given. And I think really um, the people in the audience benefit a lot from what they had to share from the experiences. Maybe you don't understand all of what they're saying now, but you will do so in due time. Just take heed of what they have said. And on that note, please give them a good standing applause for me. Uh, before the Congress uh, yeah, and Madam Chair uh, says, I have a little surprise for the ladies here. Uh, the Deccan is not here, so I'm not really following rules about Exxon Mobile not getting presents. <laughs> In June of uh, Women's Day and Teacher's Day, uh, we would just like to present